Wherever you are and whenever you are watching, welcome to Kilderman Church. I'm Alan Hamilton. This Advent Sunday, let me say that Joseph, as in Mary and Joseph, is a bit of a hero of mine. A hero because of what he didn't do. Joseph ben Jacob, Joseph the son of Jacob, did not lead a great people on an epic journey. He never commanded a mighty army. He didn't even kill a single Philistine. And Joseph performed no miracles or delivered any prophecies in God's name. And neither did he hold power or achieve great learning. As far as we know, Joseph, son of Jacob, was not particularly important, except perhaps in his own family. And nor did he accumulate much in the way of money or hold a prestigious job. Joseph ben Jacob is a bit of a hero of mine because of what he didn't do. Incidentally, we know the name of Joseph's father and even his grandfather because the writer of the gospel we call Matthews gives us a list of ancestors of Joseph right back to Abraham. This is primarily a statement of theological truth rather than biological certainty. But there's no reason to doubt the names of Joseph's immediate forebears. But why list Joseph's ancestors at all? Well, the reason is this. It's because of what Joseph didn't do. As uh, we will have spoken about with our children uh, in church this morning, this Advent Sunday morning, Joseph didn't do what he wanted to do. But more than that, Joseph didn't do what he was entitled to do, what was expected that he would do, what was right for him to do. And Joseph was a righteous man. Matthew tells us that he was faithful to the law. And Joseph was a righteous man who knew that he was not the father of Mary's child. And righteous men do not stick with a wife-to-be who's pregnant with someone else's child. No, they distance themselves as far and as fast and as publicly as they can. The alternative is disgrace and ridicule, and in an honour-bound society, that was a lifelong sentence. So, Ju so Joseph should have done what he wanted to do, albeit quietly and without exposing Mary to public disgrace. Joseph should have divorced Mary quietly, cast her off. And that's why Joseph appears in what is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. These are the words with which the gospel of Matthew begins. And, and that genealogy ends with these words. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. All because of what Joseph didn't do. And that's where we take up the story. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he'd considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This Joseph is a bit of a hero of mine because of what he didn't do. Am I focusing too much on the negative? Well, Joseph didn't do what he wanted to do, what he was entitled to do, what a righteous man with any regard for his own reputation was bound to do. Well, that's absolutely true. But what about the what about the converse? What about what Jesus actually did do? Is that not just as laudable two sides of the same heroic coin? Well, of course, that's entirely fair. Yes, uh, Jesus did listen to and obey God when God spoke to him in a dream through his angel. 
And yes, Joseph did do what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. And when Mary gave birth to a son, he gave him the name Jesus. But I'd like to stick a little longer with what Joseph didn't do. And here's why. I want us to think about sin. Never a popular topic, certainly not with me. But in a moment, I'd like us to rethink what we understand sin to be. But meantime, ponder this. Had Joseph done what he wanted, no one would have faulted him. He'd have done what any right-thinking person of his time and place would have approved of, would have applauded. But he'd have sinned. He'd have chosen to do what he wanted ahead of what God wanted. His own plan would have trumped God's plan. And that's sin. Jesus, the name that God instructed Joseph to give to Mary's son, is the Greek version of Joshua. And Joshua in Hebrew means the Lord saves. Saves from what? Well, remember what we read? An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are about to give him, uh, sorry, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Most people assume the Bible has a lot to say about how messed up humans are, and that's true. It's also true that the Bible's vocabulary about this topic sounds odd to modern people, using words like sin, iniquity, or transgression. And so the Bible's perspective on the human condition is often ignored or treated as ancient and backwards. This is really unfortunate. Because through these words, the biblical authors are offering us a deeply profound diagnosis of human nature. Iniquity describes behavior that's crooked, while transgression refers to breaking trust. And sin? This is actually the most common of these bad words in the Bible. So let's focus on it for a few minutes. Sin translates the Hebrew word chata and the Greek word hamartia. The most basic meaning of sin isn't religious at all. Chata simply means to fail or miss the goal. Like when the Israelite tribe of Benjamin trained a small army of slingshot experts, they could sling a stone at a hare and not chata, that is, fail or miss. Or there's a biblical proverb that warns against making hasty decisions because you're likely to chata your way, miss your destination. So in the Bible, sin is a failure to fulfill a goal. But what's the goal? Well, on page one of the Bible, we learn that every human is an image of God, a sacred being who represents the Creator and is worthy of respect. And so in this way of seeing the world, sin is a failure to love God and others by not treating them with the honor they deserve. You can see this idea in the famous code of conduct given to the Israelites, the Ten Commandments. Half of them identify ways you can fail at loving God, and the other half name ways you can fail at loving people. And the fact that both kinds of failure are combined shows that failing to honor God is deeply connected to failing to honor people. This is why in the Bible, sin against people is sin against God. Like when Joseph refuses to sleep with the wife of Potiphar, he says, how could I sin against God? In Joseph's mind, failing to honor a human made in God's image is a failure to love God. And so, sin is a failure to be truly human. But there's more. A fascinating thing about sin in the Bible is that most of the time that people are failing, they either don't know it, or even worse, they think they're succeeding. Like when Pharaoh wants to build Egypt's economy and protect national security, in his mind, this justifies enslaving the Israelites. He thinks it's good, and he's totally unaware that it's an epic fail. Or when King Saul is chasing David around the wilderness trying to kill him, he thought he was bringing a criminal to justice until he realizes he's the corrupt one. And he says, I have sinned. I am the failure. So sin is about more than just doing bad things. It describes how we easily deceive ourselves and spin illusions to redefine our bad decisions as good ones. So why are humans such bad judges between moral failure and success? Well, the first appearance of the word sin in the Bible offers an insight. There are these two brothers, Cain and Abel. Their parents had just given in to this beastly temptation to redefine good and evil by their own wisdom, and now Cain is faced with a similar choice. He's jealous and angry that God has favored his brother, and so God warns him, if you don't choose what is good, chata is crouching at the door, it wants you, but you can rule over it. So in these stories, 
Sin, or moral failure, is depicted as this wild, hungry animal that wants to consume humans. And we know how that story ends. The Bible is trying to tell us that failed human behavior, our tendency towards self-deception, it runs deep. It's rooted in our desires and selfish urges that compel us to act for our own benefit at the expense of others. And it leads to this chain reaction of relational breakdown. This is why in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul describes hamartia as a power or a force that rules humans. In his words, we are slaves to sin. He even says sin lives in us so that the things I don't want to do, that's what I do. So with the word sin, the biblical authors are offering a robust description of the human condition. It's a failure to be humans who fully love God and others. It's our inability to judge whether we're succeeding or failing. And it's that deep selfish impulse that drives much of our behavior. This is not a pretty picture of ourselves, but if we're honest, it's realistic. This is why in the Bible, the story of Jesus is such good news. He's depicted as the creator become a truly human one who did not fail to love God and others. That is, he did not sin. And yet, he took responsibility for humanity's history of failure. He lived for others and he died for their sins. And he was raised from the dead to offer them the gift of his life that covers for their failures. Or in the words of the apostles, he committed no sin, yet he carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to our sins and live to do what is right. And that's the story behind the biblical word for sin. So what about this concept, what we've just heard? A fascinating thing about sin in the Bible is that most of the time that people are failing, they either don't know it, or even worse, they think they're succeeding. Sin is about more than doing bad things. It describes how easily we deceive ourselves and spin illusions to redefine our bad decisions as good ones. Had Joseph done what he wanted to do, what everyone would have expected and applauded him to do, he would have sinned. Sin is about more than doing bad things. It describes how easily we deceive ourselves and spin illusions to redefine our bad decisions as good ones. Well, firstly, he'd have treated Mary with hard-hearted cruelty. I'm not saying that betrayal and marriage should be or is easily forgiven. Sometimes infidelity destroys the relationship and that relationship is best ended. But that wasn't the case here. And Joseph knew that, even on a human level. And that's why he wanted to spare Mary as much as possible. But to have gone ahead to cast Mary aside with all the terrible consequences for her and her child, that would not have been an expression of love for another human being or for God. It would have been a sin. And of course, to have ignored God, for Joseph to have put himself above God, that's the very definition of sin. Joseph didn't do either. He honoured Mary and he honoured God. Yet, and this is where I'd like to linger, how often does our doing what we're entitled to do really honour other human beings, really honour God? How often does doing or saying what right-minded people of our time and place think is okay actually amount to sin? I think back and I think of right now. What are we doing in our churches that is considered acceptable or right or even laudable, that is actually sin. Are we letting the world around us drown out God so that we're redefining our bad decisions as good decisions? Are we too eager to do what we want or what we're told we should do? And too quick to tell God himself what's right. Well, that's dishonoring God and it inevitably leads to dishonoring others and that is sin. Now, if you're nodding along and thinking, if only we did what the Bible tells us, immorality on every level is destroying our world, let's get back to old-fashioned standards. If that's what you're thinking, I'd ask you to think again. The past was not so great. And yes, we may have gone to church more, but did we really sin less? And this is where Joseph is really my hero. Yes, he knew what he could do and what others thought he should do. But he let God decide what he would do. And God's decision was love, mercy, and grace for all humankind. 
And he asked Joseph to be a part of that. And Joseph said yes, knowing that he would bear a cost, knowing that Mary would give birth to a son and that he would accept that son as his own son and that he would give him the name Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. Amen.